Following a branch of the Deseran River, in the hills northeast of Golden Fields, lies Grud Hog, an impressive feat of goblinoid engineering in the den of the hill giant chiefess, Guh. If the characters can defeat Guh and obtain her conch of teleportation, they can use it to teleport to Maelstrom, King Hecaton's undersea citadel. Hello everyone, I'm Alex, and today we are going to discuss Chapter 5 of Storm King's Thunder, The Den of the Hill Giants. Your party presented the Electrum Nose Ring from the Grandfather Tree, or the Bone Great Club from Ravenrock to the Oracle, and learned the location of Grudhog, one of the giant lairs containing one of Hecaton's conches. The party may have found their way to Grudhog without the help of the Oracle at all, Perhaps they met Moog via the Old Tower encounter in Chapter 3, or the party encountered the Hill Giants in Chapter 2 and followed their trail of stolen livestock and trampled fields. Regardless, your party now finds themselves on the doorstep of the Hill Giant Chiefess, Guh. Chief Guh would like the Hill Giants elevated above all others, as she is tired of being at the bottom. But she is no brighter than a typical Hill Giant, so her plan is anything but inspired. She plans to eat until she grows so enormous that the gods take notice and show her favor. To her, and all hill giants, the biggest giant rules. So this logic is not without reason. Guh has been feasting for several months and has grown to such a size that she can no longer walk on her own. She spends her time slumped in a wagon with broken axles, surrounded by heaps of stolen loot and crying out for more food. Chief Guh has driven away all the other female hill giants in her tribe and taken their husbands as her own. She tasks her many husbands with bringing her food and defending her lair. Farmers who live downriver from Grudhog have suffered the most. The first trouble was a sudden drop in the river's water level caused by the dam-like structure of the hill giant den. Not long thereafter, Guh's husbands and their followers began plundering livestock from the riverside farms, stealing trees from orchards, knocking down cottages, and snatching up folk who didn't run fast enough. Most of the hill giants' activities have been confined to the region of the Desrian Valley closest to their den, but as food becomes scarce, Guz's husbands are forced to expand their efforts outwards. The villages of Belliard, Wormfrud, and Olven, as well as caravans traveling the Iron Road between Wormfrud and Olven, are all within the Hill Giant's threat radius. If the party passes through these settlements, the news of the giant attacks would be the talk of the town. Meanwhile, the female Hill Giants exiled by Guh have taken to the hills. They crave the return of their husbands, but they are neither strong enough nor shrewd enough to unseat Guh. The book suggests they might be convinced to help adventurers overthrow her, like Moog. If you think that your party needs more assistance, or if at some point in the dungeon they become in over their heads, perhaps these rowdy female hill giants intervene and assist. The hill giant's den is called Grudhog, which means river mound in giant. Resembling a beaver dam, it straddles a river. The lower level of the den is lodged between two rocky outcroppings and made of piled timber packed with clay and mud, with hollow cavities that resemble caves. Above this piled timber foundation is a mud steading with a log roof. The book provides assistance with methods the party may use to reach the den, as well as rules for a stealthy approach. I recommend using these guidelines as they make sense and work for the grand majority of methods the party would use to get inside. Anytime the party decides to short rest, be sure to reposition the inhabitants of the lair, depending on the party's current position and the actions that they have taken so far throughout the dungeon crawl. If the party is getting an edge, then their opponents should get one as well. Roll for extra reinforcements whenever appropriate, and if you feel like a particular encounter is underwhelming or you need some extra bodies, don't hesitate to use the reinforcement table. Don't forget to look over the Dungeon General Features sidebar before continuing, specifically the Climbing and Curtains sections, as these are most likely going to be relevant to the party's activities inside. There are really only three entry points for the party. The front door, the lower level caves, or the back door near the lookout tower. I would believe that the lookout tower is the most difficult location to sneak by without being spotted, I would consider giving the party a small negative modifier to their stealth check if they decide to take this entry route. 
Sneaking into the lower levels ensures that the majority of the dungeon will be explored, and is the preferred entry route in my opinion. If you wish, you could have it so the boulder blocking the front door is actually sufficient to stop the party from continuing. Keep in mind that the hill giant guarding the door is Hruk, Moog's husband. If Moog is with the party and spots Hruk, she would no doubt grab him by the scruff and drag him back into the forest, and she could even block the entrance herself to stop any pursuers, leaving the party with no one to move the boulder and force them to seek other entryways. If the party enters through the lower level, they will encounter Oinker Boinker and the Hill Giant Butcher, two of the mini-bosses of the dungeon, as well as the prisoners that Guh has taken recently. When the parties arrive at the pig pen, they will encounter the Etten Pigmaster known as Oinker Boinker. He has a crew of seven bugbears with him, and his bonus to perception makes him a difficult foe to surprise. When the players enter a combat with him, use the pigs as often as possible to deter the party's advances. The pig pen should be considered difficult terrain for everyone except Oinker Boinker, and the bugbears should use the pigs as cover for ranged attacks, as the book suggests. Consider beefing Oinker Boinker a bit, or having the bugbears in the prison area assist for stronger parties. Any loud AOE spells or noises in the room would, no doubt, alert Chief Guh to the party's presence. Finally, ensure that Oinker Boinker is able to shout his name in some context during the fight for obvious reasons. The prisoners in the book all make sense and can explain the atrocities Guh and her giants have wrecked upon the local area if the party is unfamiliar with her. If the Barbarian survives and is able to bestow his mark onto the party, they should be awarded inspiration. If anyone is a member of the Emerald Enclave, consider having Galvin Dragonmore assist the party with threats in the dungeon. Slug, the Butcher of Grudhog, and his pet Utyug are the next trial the party must face. If the party enters his chamber from the pig pen, I suggest he immediately flip the table over and take cover as ranged characters would have an easy time ticking him down for multiple rounds before he can approach. His pet Utyug should remain close by and guard him, using his action to ready for anyone attempting to approach. Slug could toss butcher cleavers, knives, and other kitchen tools at the characters from behind the table until there is someone within melee range. At that time, he sicks his pet upon his foes, arms himself with his great club, and rises to full height. These simple changes turn a very straightforward encounter into a memorable dungeon moment. When the characters defeat Slug, they should then begin exploring the upper level. Run the kitchen encounter as written, unless the goblins are somehow alerted of the party's presence beforehand. Obviously, if the party emerges from the larder, then have the goblins flee into the feasting hall instead. Here is also where the party can encounter the final mini-boss of the dungeon, the Watermaster. The Watermaster is just a normal hobgoblin, and is extremely underwhelming as an enemy. One option is to play up his thematics. Describe a heavy-footed creature approaching from behind the curtain. His shadow, from beyond, appears larger than any giant the party has seen so far. Then he steps beyond the veil of the curtain, just to reveal that the threat is a regular hobgoblin. Of course, the Watermaster then delivers a speech to inspire his men and boast of his accomplishments to the party, only to be cut down in a round or two at best. Another option is to add the Hobgoblins from the Watchtower to his entourage, boost his health and armor slightly, and give him a parry reaction to make him stand out a little more than the rest. One final idea for the Watermaster. You could have him strike a deal with the party, saying if they defeat Guh and oust the Hill Giants, then he can control the other goblinoids of the den and become its ruler. This arrangement could cause the goblins to assist the party in the encounter with Guh, as commanded by the Watermaster, as long as it is clear the party will come out on top. If the characters get this far without raising the alarm and present themselves to Guh, she initially doesn't know what to make of them. Are they servants sent by one of her allies? Are they food? Unless the characters convince Guh that they are more valuable alive than dead, she assumes the latter and orders her mates and minions to beat them to death so that she can feast on their flesh and gnaw on their bones. If the characters tell Guh a story that explains why they need her conch of teleportation, she wiggles uncomfortably but refuses to give up the item. 
instead ordering her servants to attack. If her underlings are defeated, she trades the conch for her life. The most important thing to remember is how Ga acts and reacts in this encounter. She would normally take on a less than active role in fighting the party, but if a member of the party approaches her, she does swing at them with her weapon with the little reach that she has. Inform any party member who gets close enough to her about the damaged axle, or allow them to make the intelligence check on their turn. Ideally, the fight plays out like a movie scene, where the benevolent ruler sicks its posse on the uninvited guests. Ga should remain uninvolved in the fight, unless forced to participate. If characters have been paying attention, they should deduce that the hill giants fear Ga and do not wish to be here. Many of her underlings are enslaved and have no reason to stay if she is defeated. If the players fail to notice or discover this, perhaps give them the opportunity to make an insight check to learn this information by studying the mannerisms and attitudes of the giants in the feast hall. Another tip, if your party avoided the other encounters in the dungeon and confronted Ga early, consider having the wolves become released and ridden by the goblins throughout the combat. The orcs would no doubt join in the fun, but they have no reason to stay if Ga is slain. Regardless, the encounter ends when one of the two things occur. Ga dies, the morale of Grudhog's other denizens breaks, and they flee into the wilderness. Or, as stated before, Ga's underlings are defeated, and she trades the conch for her life. The treasure possessed by Ga can only be obtained if she is killed, or if she is forced out of her cart, as described in the book. The book suggests after the conch has been obtained that the characters may flee with it, or barricade themselves in a room to attune to it. Unless Ga is still alive, these options are likely not to occur, as if Ga is defeated, the remaining hill giants and goblinoids flee. Once the party is able to attune to the conch, they will finally reach Maelstrom and begin the next stage of the adventure. Well, that is the Den of the Hill Giants. Be sure to check back for my next Storm King's Thunder video, The Canyon of the Stone Giants. Thanks for watching.